Tabor was a whale man, shipwrecked far from home. He dreamed of Nantucket Island, the place where he was born. Then one day, far in the distance, he saw could catch and ride that well, Nantucket bound I'd be, he said, Nantucket bound I'd be. Hi gang, Tom Loria here. Welcome back to the shop and welcome to episode six of Building a Whale Boat. And before we get started with today's episode, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who's been supporting me uh, since I decided to demonetize my channel, at least until November 2020. One of you guys that wrote in to me uh, to tell me that, you know, when you demonetize, they drop you down in the ratings. So that prompted me to ask in my last video that if you like the content that I'm putting out, do hit the like and subscribe buttons. If you haven't subscribed already, also hit the notification button because that'll tell you when I upload new content like this. You guys have been very supportive, very positive, and I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your support with those clicks on the like button and the subscribe button. So what are we going to cover today? We are going to cover framing, framing our whale boat. There are two methods that I'm going to describe for framing the whale boat. One has to do with the method of building that we're doing, which is a solid hull carved out and how that gets framed up. And if you were to make a plank on frame model, the major differences between these two styles of building and framing. Uh, we're also going to cover some of the things that need to go on the boat before we actually start inserting frames. We're going to go over how I make the frames, uh, what details need to be included and what details don't have to be included. And we'll make a boat hook, we'll make some paddles, and if we have time, I'm also going to start on some of the parts we're going to need that go in the boat. And when you get through the framing, the next things you're going to be putting in are things like uh, the cutty boards and the lion's tongue and uh, the head sheets and the stern sheets. So all that's got to be gone over and I'm going to try and all fit it into this one episode. <laughs> Good luck with that. Anyhow, let's get started. So what needs to go on the boat before we start? We've already installed the stem, the stern post, and the keel. Now we need to make and install the two topmost planks, port and starboard. We'll also need to make and install the rubber rails and the interior rails as well. Now, the need for all of this exterior work will be made clear when framing begins. So let's get started on the outside so we can get to the inside. The number seven and eight planks are pretty wide, roughly nine inches each. You should be able to use the plans to lay these planks out but you may need to make small adjustments for your model. The important thing to remember here is that you need to locate that number seven plank on the hull accurately. Much of what happens in the next few steps will be reliant on doing that carefully and accurately. For the sake of this demo, let's say the exposed part of the plank is nine inches wide, or at scale, a quarter of an inch you'll want to leave about another sixteenth of an inch to allow for the overlap of the shear strake which is installed right above it. Uh, you'll also notice that these planks have a strong taper to them. They're full width in the midship as you might expect but forward of station three and aft of station six there is a dramatic reduction in the width down to about three inches by the time they hit the stem and the stern post. And making the taper is fairly straightforward. Guide marks are penciled in at the appropriate spots, aft of six and forward of three, and then at the ends to mark their final width. And to cut the taper, a straight edge and a sharp blade 
is all that's needed. After making several light passes through the plank for a cleaner finish, we'll be left with a rather sharp transition. And before the plank can be installed, we have to deal with that. And it's easy enough to do. I just use an emery board to blend in the two areas into the full width of the plank. Holding it in a vise makes the job quick and painless. Now it's also a good idea to make both planks port and starboard at the same time. It's a whole lot easier to check to see that they're identical while they're still on the workbench. It's also a good idea to mark them for port and starboard. On their inner faces it would probably be better. And on the outer face, mark the number 5 station line because you'll be using that as a reference. And it's really important to mark which end is forward. Take it from the voice of experience. You don't want to have to strip off a plank because you installed one correctly and the other one backwards. Now, you might also be tempted to make the shear strikes now, too. But I would advise waiting until both number seven planks are on the boat, just to be sure there are no unpleasant surprises. Besides, it really doesn't save much in the way of time in the end. In this photo, if you look about four feet back from the stem, you'll see that the number seven plank starts to taper into the number six plank until it reaches the stem where it's just about totally flush. I've also seen examples where the number seven plank continues overlapping its full length. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that either option could be correct. Your call. Now, with the number seven plank's location marked on the hull in an earlier step, I next marked the ends of the hull at the spots where the bottom of that plank needs to end up. Now, I make sure that these are symmetrical port and starboard and fore and aft. Now, I usually install the planks in three stages starting at the midship station, then working out to the ends. In this case, I've already put on the aft end, and here you just see me gluing up the forward end. And as you can see, the operation takes a lot of clamping, and there's a good reason for that. As you move out towards the end of the model, that very thin plank will want to buckle as you try and impart the compound curve needed to have it finish up at the right spot on the hull. Using clamps, literally, one next to the other, makes that potential problem pretty much go away. Now, after both number seven planks are on, the shear strikes will be next, but before they can be installed, there's one more small task I need to perform. I need to give the top edge of the number seven plank a small bevel. Not much, maybe about a sixteenth of an inch or so. This will help the shear strake lay a little flatter and a bit more upright when it's in place. Now in this photo, if you look at the interior of the shear strake at the midship area, it almost appears to be vertical. In order for our model to be convincing, I have to come as close to that as I can. Careful carving and sanding in earlier stages should take care of most of this concern. But if the exterior planks are put on with this goal in mind, it gives a little extra wiggle room, just in case you need to adjust the interior shape. Not to mention, installing the planks correctly does a world of good for the appearance of the model. How much bevel is enough? It only takes a little. I put a dark pencil line on the top edge of the hull and mark about a sixteenth of an inch on the top edge of the plank. Then I use an emery board, one of my favorite tools, to impart the bevel. When the board takes the line off the hull, that's usually adequate to the task. Maybe you might have to go a little bit more. Now I'm sure some, if not all of you, have noticed what appears to be a rather lumpy spot on the shear line and that I don't seem to be very concerned about it. 
and there's a reason for that. During the cutting or carving of the hull, it's possible, indeed likely, you'll wander off the marked shear line. If there are only one or two spots with small discrepancies, it's probably best if that's not corrected until the shear strakes and the rails are applied, and you'll see why a little bit later. The shear strake will be the determining factor in what the boat's profile will look like, provided you've measured, cut, and installed the planks correctly. Having the midship section of the plank, the stem and the stern ends, all hitting their marks should leave you with the proper shear. Now hopefully there'll only be slight wanderings and you won't have much to correct. In the case of this whale boat, clearly I will have to sand down that high spot. But as I mentioned earlier, I'll do that later. Now some of you may be thinking, if you have a high or a low spot on your shear, how can you trust that as an accurate reference to mark out plank locations and other features? Easy. I made a template for checking the shear line. And I just put the template along the center line of the model and viewing it from a point level with the bottom edge of the template and a little bit of light behind it, I can instantly see any high or low spots. In the case of this model, it's that high spot that we already know exists. It's high by a 32nd of an inch. So anything that's referenced off that midship point is just increased by that much. And voila, I've got a reliable reference. Now, gluing the exterior rails comes next, and they're done pretty much the way you'd expect. Stock is sized and sanded, like the strakes, and they are glued in starting, you guessed it, in the middle. And then I work out towards the ends. Now, I'm only showing one rail here because interior or exterior, they're all done exactly the same way. And there's very little point to me repeating something four times when you guys have got it after one. And as you can also see, it takes a lot of clamps. You just can't have too many clamps. Sounds like it could be a tattoo. Or maybe an epitaph. Moving on. When it comes to making your frames, you've got a choice. And there's no right or wrong choice here, merely a personal preference. You can make them from wood, soak them, and bend them in a form. Or you could make them from styrene plastic. I just heard a gasp of horror and total disbelief from somebody. Plastic on a wooden boat? Yup. There's nothing inherently incompatible, evil, or destructive about plastic. It's just a material that, in certain circumstances, is very useful to the model builder. Now, there are plenty of materials and substances that are on my don't ever let me see you use that list, but plastic isn't one of them, and that's a subject for another video. My guide for choosing material is practical application. If it fits your needs, use it. The only exception for me is if I've been commissioned to build a model, then the client has final say over all aspects of the project. And with respect to that practical application part of this, the whaleboat is a perfect example. For boats 1 32nd scale and bigger, the choice is wood. For models below that, like this 1 48th whaleboat, plastic strips work great for frames and stems. And now that I've kicked the hornet's nest, let's move on and make some wooden frames. And speaking of wood, the wood you choose for the frames can be almost anything. Anything you can buy or mill to the working size you needed. The only exceptions might be pine and balsa. In this case, 1 32nd square frames are good for the size and for the species I chose white holly because it's what I had at the time. Now my usual practice for making wood pliable is to soak it in ammonia. You've heard me say this before but I'll say it again. Use this stuff only in a well-ventilated area. 
It will fry your nasal passages and your brain cells in nothing flat. Now, moving on to the controversy between water and ammonia. I've never done a side-by-side -side comparison with water, but my instinct is that ammonia may give you more consistent and faster results. When the wood is thoroughly soaked, which only takes about five or ten minutes, the wood turns green, but as it dries, it reverts to its natural color. So, if the color of the wood is important for your model, fear not, all will be well. Now that the wood is nice and pliable, we need something to bend it on. This is a bending trap, just like the one used in the beetle shop. And here's my version, made from a scrap of poplar and a couple of pieces of eighth inch plywood. Like its full-size brother, my trap is carved to the profile of the midship's frame. In both the real boat and our model, the frames are all bent to that shape and then just altered to fit their locations. Here's how it works. At each end here and here, you'll be able to see that there's a kind of like a, a stop. And it's the same size as the stock I use for the frames, which is about 30 thousandths, 32 thousandths. The reason that I like to have these stop frames here, glued on here, is because it's important when you're doing this to bend your frames straight. You don't want them going off at an angle. So you want to try and keep them as straight as possible. So if you can line them up that way when it comes time to actually bend them they'll lean up against that stop and they will just naturally bend straight because they will bend cockeyed if you let them okay Now, if this was anything other than a demonstration, I would probably be filling this up with more frames. But for this demonstration, this is just fine. Okay. So now, as you might suspect, that one goes there. Okay, so the frames are all dry, and it's time to take them out of the trap. So let's see how we did. Well, I think we did all right. Let's move on. The great thing about these frames is that the top and bottom are literally interchangeable. In the midship section, you'd use them as intended, cutting the scallop into the top of the frame and then nipping off the excess at the bottom. But as you get further out to the ends, it makes more sense to flip the frames end for end, cut off the excess curve of what used to be the top, and fit what used to be the bottom under the rail, then cut the scallop in last. Now, I used to have a boss that his favorite expression was, work smarter, not harder. And I think that probably fits into this category. Now, cutting the scallop, as I mentioned earlier, cutting the scallop should be done first on any frame 
where you're using it right side up. If you're inverting the frame, then it gets cut last. Either way, this is what it looks like. In this cross-section view, you can now see the need for getting all those exterior details and rails in place before the framing could begin. In the beetle shop, once scalloped, the upper end of the frame was jammed snug up underneath the inner rail. Then all the marking, cutting, and notching was done. And finally, the frame was clench nailed in place. Now there are some important details here that highlight the main differences between solid hull construction and plank on frame methods. Now you'll notice that for the four edge joint planks there are battens spanning the joint and that the lower ends of the frames are notched to go over the keel and that that lower end spans the entire width of the keel. Each frame has to be fitted for those details. For a plank on frame method, the first step is to mark out the frame for length and then for the rebate that has to be cut into the underside of the bottom end of the plank of the frame, excuse me. If the plank fits, you can move on to step two. Marking out the locations of the four battens that have to be let into the frame. Step three, cut in the notches. Here I'm just using a Dremel with an emery wheel for the initial cuts. If the shape needs any refinement, I use files. And then step four, Give it a light sanding to remove any of the fur left by the emery wheel cuts, and then install it on the model. Great. Only 62 more to go. Since the interior of our boat is smooth, and I've sized the false keel to reflect the height difference, the frames can just lay flat against the hull and butt up to the interior keel. Now, before I go too much further, it's probably a good idea to talk about how to locate the frames accurately and about the order for installation. Now, the easiest way to locate the upper ends of the frames is with a template like this one. It's just a copy of the interior details drawing but I've trimmed off the rails, so now the template can fit inside the model, and that helps a lot with accurately locating things. I match up the station lines on the template with the ones on the model, and once I'm sure they're aligned, I mark out all 20 thwart frames at one time. Now the location of the bottom of the frames can be taken right off the plans, and here it's just a matter of measuring between a thwart frame, any thwart frame, and its nearest station line, and then transferring that measurement to the inner keel of the model, which should still have the station lines marked on it. Now, whether I'm working on thwart frames or one of the ones in between, they're all located on the model with the help of these two spacers made for the task. You're looking at spacers that I made for the 124th scale boats, that's because I broke the ones for this one, so I have to replace those. But the idea is that you just use something that will yield accurate and repeatable results. Now, as far as the order I use for the boats, I find it easiest to, you guessed it, start in the middle and work to the ends. All the thwart frames go in first, then I move to the ends, and then finally I'll fill the spaces in between the thwarts.
and you're marking for length, it helps if you can stab the frame enough so that it sticks in there. This way you know you've got mark that you can find when you go to cut it. Sometimes you get the length right enough so that there's enough pressure just by holding it at the top and the bottom that it will hold the frame in place while it dries. It doesn't happen very often, but it's nice when it does. So here, as you might have guessed, I'm using the frames inverted. I only need a small amount of curve for the bottom, so all the excess was cut away from what used to be the top. Then you'll see me measure, scallop, and fit the frame in place. And that's it for framing. It's really no more complicated than that. Cut, fit, glue, repeat. Done. And speaking of done, I know I said we were going to cover a few more topics in this episode, but clearly I was visiting another reality when I said that. There's plenty to unpack here in this half hour, but I promise episode 7 will deal with installing the ceiling planks, the head and the stern sheets, and we will make those paddles and the boat hook. So if you have any questions or comments, leave them below. You know, you guys, I love to hear from you and I'll try and answer the questions as best I can. So until episode seven, stay well, stay strong, treat each other nicely. Now, break's over. Get back in the shop. They pulled the whale to the harbor and set him free to roam. John Tabor watched as the whale swam on. Young Johnny boy was home, oh yes, John Tabor now was home, John Tabor.